Hi guys, uh, it's been a while since we met last time in our lessons and for today let's continue working, let's continue discussing OCAF and uh, if you remember last time we ended up with a small main function uh, that was supposed to demonstrate some basics of the OpenCascade application framework and for today let's try to make, to make something more realistic out of this empty exercise so let's quickly recap what we've been doing last time. So uh, here we have our application instance, which is a main entity, one of the main, one, one of the key entities in OCAF. We have this entity allocated here, but you might also want to keep it as a singleton object in your application. And then using this application, we created a document and we passed there something uh, this magic string uh, binocav to have this uh, binary format for our documents. So here we have our document and we should never forget to call this static define format function on our application and this way to uh, register our formats to say uh, that we are going to use this, this binary uh, storage and retrieval drivers. And once we have this document, it's time to populate it with the data and we used what is called the main label in OCAF. It's simply a label with uh, zero column one entry. This composition of label tags is called an entry in OCAF terminology, in OCAF jargon. So uh, once we have this label, we are not going to create it actually because it's already there, we just access it. And once we have it, we uh, hook up an attribute of a primitive type. It was just a integer attribute coming from tdata std package. And uh, there we go. And uh, then we wanted also to, you know, to inspect our data hierarchy to see if we are doing things correctly. So what we did, we stored this a simple document with one label and one attribute to a CBF file, which is a cascade binary file. And then we used uh, draw console to inspect this uh, document. So what we did, we uh, launched a draw session, we load all the plugins, and then we opened our uh, document right here in draw. And since we were using this uh, standard binary format, Open Cascade uh, didn't have any problems with opening this file. And then we used this uh, df browse command to get into this uh, visual explorer of our OCAF document. And what do we see here is uh, that we have our main label, and underneath we have this uh, tdata std integer with the value we put there. So it's all working, and we can use this. Uh, dear browse command to debug and to uh, visually inspect uh, all our OCAF related uh, code, all our OCAF related logic. Now let's talk about what is called data scheme because you can imagine that if you want to make something more realistic in OCAF, it's going to be quite, you know, a complex exercise because you will have to deal a lot with labels and attributes. You will have to keep in mind how all those labels are organized. You will have to, you will have to keep this scheme somewhere. You might also want even to print it out on a sheet of paper and pin it somewhere on your wall. And this way, I mean, use it as an instruction, use it as a data scheme. So let's talk about this data scheme thingy because it's pretty important and it's not unique uh, to talk about things like that when we when we are using OCAF. We are doing essentially the same things uh, as when we are using some, you know, uh, database engines like uh, SQL and non-SQL database engines. They all assume that you first somehow design your data organization and then you uh, follow your data scheme which you designed once. So what we are going to have in this exercise of today, we are going to have two root labels. One label is for parts and another is for meshes. And under this parts label, I am going to have sub-labels which would represent individual parts. 
and under each part I'm going to have sub labels to represent some features of a part because I just want to give it a, a bit more and uh, more complex organization so that we can practice how it feels when, when you have to deal with some sub labels of an object and we might have several features under the part and when it comes to the attributes because if you remember labels they they are supposed to give your model a structure they are supposed to give you like a skeleton of your data model and when it comes to real data you need to use uh, what is called an attribute so for a part we start with a name we will have uh, like a named part in our OCAF data model then we will also bring there a shape because we really want to store boundary representation like a nominal geometry of our part and finally we will have some colors because uh, why not to uh, differentiate between our parts uh, visually why not to have some colors uh, for the features uh, okay it's uh, probably less uh, less obvious thing how would you store a feature i would propose to store just a set of uh, face indices there because in open cascade you can you know just count all your faces enumerate them as long as you explore your shape and uh, this way you can store those persistent indices in your data model to address uh, faces uh, edges and vertices so let's let's keep just one set of one unordered set of indices in each feature uh, then for meshes okay we are going to uh, we are going to have several labels that would represent your meshes and uh, a mesh itself, uh, the mesh object will contain triangulation. This is a surface triangulation, like a discrete representation of your geometry. And I also want to keep like a back reference to the originating uh, geometry of my mesh. So that we have like a reference geometry and we keep a link between our mesh object and our part. And that's uh, always a good thing in a finite element analysis, especially when you you know generate your meshes you need to have this link you need to know what is a real nominal part what is a real curved surface so that you can generate your meshes uh, better in a more accurate way so okay so uh, if you if you imagine working with all those labels nested into each other and all their attributes uh, at the very low level using this open cascade or CAF API uh, you will get into a trouble shortly because it's going to give you, you know, very bad experience. You will shortly end up with some messy code. And uh, there is one well-turned idea, there is one that w good practice when you work with any database engine, even with such a, you know, uh, very specialized database, uh, so to speak, as OCAF you might want to have some data access object uh, pattern something which will hold the entire complexity of your data organization and it will only expose some very easy to comprehend api so that your system can rely on this stable api without uh, dealing that much with the internal organization of your data and, and this is what we, uh, we are going to benefit from this is a standard practice for uh, OCAF based code like to have these interface objects and uh, we will work with those interface objects instead of working directly with labels and attributes so we are going to have one interface object for a part then why not to have another interface object for a feature even though it's uh, way uh, less complicated uh, when it comes to a feature it's just one label with one attribute but you can imagine that at some point you might want to change your data scheme and introduce some more attributes or even some more structure under your feature and if you do so you will not have to refactor your whole program you know because you will only have to introduce the changes in your in your i feature uh, interface object so that you make it aware of your new format of uh, label organization and you do not change the rest of your code and that's a pretty good thing it's it's a very big deal actually okay so when we have uh, we have these parts and meshes uh, labels with pure organizational roles and i love to call them partitions it's a kind of you know not very common 
term for this sort of labels, but uh, we can call them partitions because this is what they do. They organize uh, objects of uh, um, of the same type. Uh, they they uh, give you like an, a persistent order so that you have all the object of uh, of the same type uh, stored uh, one after another in one section of your OCAV document. For meshes, uh, we are also going to have this iMesh interface, and uh, why not also to have you know a set of nested interfaces? Because uh, if you have an interface for a part and an interface for a feature, we might want to uh, hold the reference from a part to a feature in terms of interfaces. So uh, this way, we will have several i feature instances in one iPart interface. This is uh, essentially the data scheme which we are going to implement today and if you are done with that, if you understand the principle how your data is organized, you are kind of done with OCAV because you will, uh, you, you will be able to design your models and work with your models in very clean and easy to maintain way. Alright, so let's finally turn to practice and I'm going to start with creating a new class for my interface. So let me start from this iPart interface and I'm going to start with a like, constructor that would accept a reference to the root label. So the idea here is uh, that I'm going to settle down this iPart interface to a label in my OCAV hierarchy and then this interface knows what to do then, how to access the data, how to create new data chunks in there. So this is going to encapsulate the whole OCAV manipulation logic and I'm going to create a field which will be the root label. So there we go, and this root label can be initialized in the constructor. So what do we expect from this i part? We expect it to kind of uh, populate our OCAV uh, to get it prepared to, uh, to hold all the necessary information. And let's come back to the scheme. You see that I'm going to have this part somewhere in OCAV and it's going to have this address so this part is 011 the second part would be 012 and so it goes and I want to give it a name, a shape and a color so let's see what we can do right away in the constructor so uh, for example if I want to give it a name I'm going to use uh, tdata std name attribute which is a unicode string so let me first include this thing here And then I can simply set it to my label and give it some name like part. So there we go. And uh, now let's also add some new methods which we could use to populate our part objects. One of them is set shape, which would accept topodias shape reference. And here it's a bit, it's a little bit trickier actually because there is no such an attribute to store a shape because Open Cascade's um, architecture here is a bit different. It was initially designed to store the whole uh, history tree, the whole evolution of a single shape when it undergoes modeling. So instead of having just a shape attribute, Open Cascade comes up with a whole package which is uh, named TNaming. It stands for uh, topological naming. And here I need to use this TNaming builder thingy. And the real attribute which will store our shape is a TNaming named shape. But in order to settle it down to my OCAV structure, I need, I need to use this auxiliary tool. So here to set a shape, I initialize this builder. I pass it. I pass here this root label and I call a method on this builder which is a generated thing. Generate it and pass here a shape. As a result of these two instruction code 
I will have this tnaming named shape attribute on my um, label. And if I want to get shape, so let me return this top idea shape, get shape, const. I need to access this tnaming named shape attribute. So how can we do this? First we declare this attribute. It's a tnaming named shape. And then we use our root label to find this attribute. So we use a method which is a find attribute. And it accepts a global identifier of an attribute and it returns the attribute to the output argument. So here I need to pass a global identifier of this name shape attribute. I think I can use something like get id, which is a static function. Let me first include it. So I guess it's missing here. Yeah, let it be like this. And once I'm here, I need also to pass an attribute so what it returns. And this find attribute thingy, it also checks if there is no such an attribute when it's going to return false. So I'm going to check it like this. And if there is no such an attribute, then we will simply return like an empty shape. One thing to keep in mind about this code is that this top of the shape is a kind of a handle. It's a very lightweight uh, data structure which holds a reference to the shape in a heap memory. And that's why you can pass shapes by value. Uh, so although this shape will be kind of copied here once we return it from the attribute, it's not going to do a lot of, you know, useless job because uh, finally it will just copy this reference and a couple of other fields like location and orientation of the shape. So that's not a big deal and you can return your shapes by values. There is no need to type things like that and it's also impossible to do things like that. So you just pass this top of this shape. All right, so I think I have to include this top of this shape first. Here we go, we have top of the shape. And I need to access it from my attribute. I think there should be something like get, yeah, so we just return it from here. So this piece of code here, which finds an attribute from a label and uh, returns what is stored in the attribute, is a very, some, it's something very typical for OCAF based code. So you will be using things like that quite a lot when you when you're doing your OCAF exercises when you work with OCAF. So uh, what else do we have uh, in the part node is a color. So let's provide something like set color. And here I'm going to give it like a tri triple of unsigned integer values and here I will pass a red component then blue and then finally green and the problem here is that in OCAF there is no standard attribute to store those free intensity values there is no such an attribute as a color but we can work it around if we do not want to introduce our own attribute type we can still use standard attributes like we can use free integer attributes uh, and sort of you know create sub labels to hold them there in our cuff or we can pack these uh, free values in array or alternatively we can even pack those free values in a single integer and for that i can declare a variable which is i color and initialize it like I'm going to, you know, move uh, this red color by 16 bits and then unite it with uh, blue shifted by 8 bits and then I just add green component there. So using this uh, bitwise uh, operation I can easily pack this three integer values into one integer because uh, these uh, components here, we, uh, they are in range from 0 to 255 and that's quite enough. Uh, the capacity of a single integer value is quite enough to hold these three values. So that's, uh, that's a kind of good thing which I want to take advantage of. And 
I can now use tdata std integer set and pass here this i color using my root label as a host tdf label. So i color and there we go. And in the same way, you can also debug, you can also, uh, you know, you can also extract those values from, from your uh, packed integer and return it as a color. So I can take, I can uh, have another method, which is a get color. And then I use uh, reference parameters so that I can return my color components back from OCAF and here is a bit of you know magic which I just want to reuse and uh, the idea here is that once we have this eye color thingy we need to shift it back and then intersect with the mask in order to extract the values you can do this you know uh, bitwise arithmetics by yourself to check what it's going to provide you with exactly the same values the only thing i have to do i need to access this attribute and for that i'm going to use the same find attribute method once again so i'm going to find attribute of type tdata std integer then get id which is a static function and then I have this attribute there. So I need to declare it first. It's handle t data std integer attribute. And then if there is no such an attribute, then let's simply uh, return. Maybe you might also want to have like a Boolean flag here to indicate the situation where uh, if you do not have any color, when it's a, it's a problem and this way you can return false or uh, yeah so I will return true here and change these variables to R G and B yeah here we go and I only need to extract my eye color from the attribute so it's going to be something like it there we go. So let's try to use our interface object because you see that uh, the idea here is uh, that we encapsulate all the OCAF uh, logic in there in its uh, uh, getter and setter methods and from the color code it's it's going to be much easier to, to use the structures like iPart instead of working with all those uh, you know horrible labels and uh, whatever things. So let me keep this code for extracting a main label because this main label is going to be the label for my parts I will call it like parts label and uh, if you remember I also need to have this meshes label which is a second label here so for that what I can do I can create I can declare a new label like meshes label and then I need to go one level up from the parts label I take its father which is ultimate uh, you know a root in the hierarchy it's not even it's not even uh, illustrated here but it exists it's a label with a uh, tag I think it's zero we can we can check it here uh, where we have this df browse command you see that there is a label zero this is the ultimate root so what i want to do i want to step up to my root and then uh, wh while i'm here i want to create a new child with a tag number two so let's do that i have this meshes lab which is a uh, i have this sorry i have this father which is a root of my hierarchy and then i use find child find child method of it and I give a new tag to my uh, child label which is 2 and you see that there is an optional argument here which is uh, create it means that it's uh, OCAF is going to create this label in the case when I do not have a label like that OCAF can automatically create one for me and if I do not want uh, it to do this implicit job then I can pass false here and this way make this find a child a method a read-only method so let's keep uh, true here and now I have these two labels and now I want to create some parts to do that I can use this iPart 
object like an interface like part one and then I need to pass a root label of my part it's not going to be this label because it's a, like a partition label for parts instead I need to create a label underneath instead I need to have a label inside this parts label as a child of this parts label and for that I can use something like parts lab find child once again but if I use that method I need to specify this text here like if I have part one I need to pass this find child one and then find child two for the second part that's not really convenient because what I want to have I want to have these indices automatically incremented so I do not care about which part is going to be the next one because these IDs uh, they are they have nothing to do with my business logic. They are just, uh, you know, something from the internal mechanics of OCAF. So instead of using this find child method, I'm going to use something different. I'm going to use what is called TDF tag source. Because there is an alternative way how would you create labels in OCAF. And the alternative way is to have these tag source attributes. And there is a static uh, function here, which is, I think it's new child right and here you only need to pass this parts label the root label and what will happen uh, this invocation new child it will automatically settle down this tdf tag source attribute to this parts lab label and this attribute will internally hold the reference it will internally hold the counter of the indices which i'm going to use next so I can go like this and create as many parts as I want and these mechanics of indices and uh, associating new indices, new text to the newly created labels uh, will be carried on by this uh, text source attribute so I do not have to bother with this uh, sort of things. So now we have three parts they have been automatically created once we are here and finally we can save our document and see what's what's going to happen so let's try this let's try uh, uh what's that ah sure i do not need to declare anything here let's see what what's going to happen so i run this exercise and now I can go back to my draw session and uh, browse my document. But before I can do this, I first need to close my old document. And then I open it again from the file system and go like DF browse. Do I already have? Yeah. So I go like uh, DF browse. And let's see what we are going to have. Yeah, we, we have now this part number one, part number two, and part number three. And you see that these parts are kind of empty. They do not have any shapes or any colors in them. So what we can do now, we can initialize uh, some of the parts to hold some more data. So let's use part number two and use its set shape method. You see how easy it is because I do not care anymore about the internal hierarchy of the labels. Uh, it's all delegated to this interface object. This interface object knows everything about uh, the part and how it's composed. So for me, it's as simple as running this set shape method. So I need only to figure out which shape I could pass here. And let's just create a box, which is a brep prim api make box, whatever dimensions it's going to have like just anything yeah so there we go and we can also set a color set color and let it be something like this yeah so i only have to include this uh, utility class which is make box and there we go now i can run this exercise once again and see what's going to happen So once again I close my document and I open it again. So I can put it all in one instruction like a close document, then I open it and then I df browse it. Hmm, strange. I think it was already closed. 
yeah so there we go you see that my second part now contains the integer for my color it contains a name and the solid you see it's a top of the sd solid it means that i have my shape in there and you see this attribute you see this denaming named shape and by the way you see also that on my partition label i have this tdf tag source this magic beast which creates new tags for me so that i do not care about this numbering here Let's see now how can we create a feature and for that I'm going to declare another interface which is uh, going to be I feature and as usual I'm going to provide it with a constructor I feature and let it accept a label which is going to be the root label of my feature and in the same manner I'm going to initialize some member field which I need to store as a sort of a private member here. So it's going to be TDF label m root. And there we go. And now, what is uh, the idea behind this? I want to store in my feature a set of face indices. So for that, I'm going to provide another method, which is going to be something like, I don't know, set faces. And here I need to pass a sort of unordered set of, uh, you know, integer values. And for that I can use, I can benefit from the existing collection of OpenCascade, which is t call std packed map of integer. That's a good collection because it allows me not only to store the unique identifiers of my faces, but it also behaves like a bit set. It means that if I have two collections like this, if I have two uh, packed map of integers, I can intersect them, I can unite them, I can also compute the difference, so I can have a whole bunch of, you know, boolean operations uh, on those uh, data structures. And that's what I'm going to benefit from, maybe somewhere in future, but not here. Uh, here, let's just see how could we store it. And for this sort of collection, I have uh, I have an attribute in OpenCascade which is t data std. You see that the majority of attributes are all available in this t data std package. And here there is int packed map attribute which I can use here. So if you, for example, wanted to have some other uh, class here, some other data structure like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, std unordered uh, set or std map whatever you will have to either repackage it as a some somewhat standard collection of open cascade or alternatively you can also end up with your own custom attribute which is not something we would like to do right now so let's uh, take advantage of what is available right away in open cascade and for that i'm going to use this impact map and its set method once again here i have this uh, root label so let me type it here and unfortunately this set method it doesn't provide uh, the second argument of this type so i cannot easily set it in one uh, line of code but instead what i can do i can get my attribute once it is there once it is in ocav so there we go and to set my to set my feature, what I can do, I can use this change map and pass here F ideas. Ah, there we go. So this is how things actually work. And uh, okay, so now we have these set faces. And what I do, what I want to do now is I want to add a couple of methods to my iPart interface to be able to create new features in there. So, for example, what I can do, I can uh, kind of return i feature and have a method like create feature and here i am going to pass this exactly the same uh, arguments of this tickle std packed map of integer type and here what i'm going to do i'm going to take this root label of my part so i take this label here and now i need to create I need to create a sub-label under this one, which would be the root label of my feature. 
So it's going to be another child of my part. So let's see how we can do this. Again, I'm going to use this TDF tag source new child because I do not want to care about indices. And I will pass here my root and it's going to return this TDF label which I will use as a feature root label like this. And now I can return my feature initialized with this feature root label. This is going to bring me this empty feature. That's not exactly what I want to have because I also have these FIDs here. So let me call it like a feature and I'm going to use this interface a bit more and set faces FIDs and return my feature. Here I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this is not a real object here. It's just an interface. So it means but once we return this object, we actually return this, you know, lightweight data structure, which only holds this TDF label. It doesn't contain directly this set of face indices. And that's why it's totally valid to return it by value. But you might also want to make it like a handled class to locate it in a heap memory and do uh, whatever, I mean, uh, things related to dynamically uh, allocated memory and all these things, but uh, I think that that's good enough to return just a value object when it comes to uh, interface object. So we have this create feature and maybe what we can also have, we can also have something which would return all the features available on the part. So I can create a method which is get features and let me have all my features in a standard container which is vector of i feature and I'll call it like features. There we go. So I think I have to include this vector. Yeah. And now what I need to do Coming back here to our data scheme, I need to iterate all the children of my part label and create feature interfaces for each label. So what's pretty easy to do for that I can use TDF label, uh, sorry it's not, it's a TDF child iterator, child iterator and here I initialize this iterator with my root node and then I do a typical iteration. All open cascade iterators are kind of similar. They all provide this initialization logic and then you have this more and next methods. More checks that there is something else to iterate and next uh, moves your iterator to the next position. So the only remaining thing here is to include this TDF child iterator, I guess. So let's do that. There we go. And now we have this child iterator. So I think there is one one uh, thing to, to mention about it. Because uh, you see, well, once you initialize your iterator with a label, there is another flag which indicates whether you want to iterate only the first uh, level children of this label or if you want to go in if you want if you want to go deeply into your label structure in it and iterate all the levels so this is apparently not what we are going to do and uh, let's keep this uh, default behavior which is uh, going to give us only the first level children so there we go and in this body of our loop we are going to create this i feature interfaces, initialize it each one with a current label being iterated, and finally we just push back this i feature to our vector. So this is how simple it is. 
And now let's try to make use of it, of this new function. So I have this part number two, which I initialized with shape and color. And let's uh, do some uh, more uh, sophisticated structure for the part number three. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a feature. And here I need to pass the call std packed map of integer. So let me create a set of indices. Just, you know, some random set of indices I can use, like one, then, I don't know, two, then three. And I want to have another feature, which is going to contain some other indices, like, I don't know, three, four, and five. And now I can create a feature in my part number three and another feature with this collection. And let's see if I could easily access those features. I have this get features and I can declare this std vector of i feature. Let me call it like part three features and pass it here. So I'm just going to use debugger to see what's going to happen. So I put a breakpoint here, compile this whole thing, and let's run it. So here we are, we have this uh, set of indices. Now we create a feature, another one, and finally we get our features. And you see, I have this vector of uh, uh, size two, and it contains my features. So if you want, you can print them out uh, to see what these are exactly the same indices and uh, the good point about this is once these indices are in OCAF you can save them to file and you can restore them back to your memory and this way you can uh, sort of you know have persistent features in your project so let's see what's going to happen with our file which is a test CBF I come in back here so let me yeah do this trick and in my browser, you see that under the part number three, I have sublabels corresponding to my features. And these sublabels, uh, they hold those uh, attributes stored in my packed map of integer. So this is what I was uh, expecting to have actually. So it's all good. And finally, let's create a mesh. Let's create a mesh and for meshes I also want to have an interface, let me call it like iMesh. And again I'm giving it a constructor, so it's going to accept this TDF label as a root label. And I will have this root as a label here and nothing else, so let me have a private field here, which is TDF about m root and okay so now what I want to have in a mesh I want to kind of create a mesh from a part so actually you, you might want to have whatever logic you you keep in mind about all this story but just for testing let me create a method like create and here I pass I part, which is a source of my cat geometry, which I want to generate meshes for, from. So I have this I part interface. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to initialize my triangulation out of this part. And for that, I get a shape out of my part. It's topo DS shape. And now I need to create something like polytriangulation, which is a handle polytriangulation. And that's a, that, that is a data structure for triangulation for surface meshes in Open Cascade. It's a very simple thing. It, uh, it's really dedicated to visualization, but we can use it here as well. So let me call it like mesh. And then if I want to initialize it, uh, one thing I can do, I can run kind of you know exploration top exp explorer 
and iterate my part shape by faces. So here we go, we have exp more and exp next as usual. The only thing I have to do is to include this top exp explorer somewhere. There we go. So basically what we can do, we can now access current position of this iterator which is going to give us a top of the shape but since we know that we are iterating our part by faces we can also downcast it to face primitive type which is top of the face so we cast it like this and we can declare top of the face here so there we go i only have to include this top of the once again Something to include here. Yep, top of this. All right. So uh, this phase contains meshes. So actually, you can extract the meshes using this BRAP tool triangulation. So here you pass phase. You should also pass this stop lock location thingy which defines the transformation this phase has and it returns this uh, handle to poly triangulation so basically the meshes of a cat part are distributed by cat faces and ideally what I had to do I had to explore my part shape extract all the triangulation of all my faces and somehow merge them into one single mesh here. But let's keep it simple, and uh, this is not exactly the correct way of doing things, but uh, for this demonstration uh, is going to be enough. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going just to extract triangulation of the first phase we are iterating, and then just break the loop. So it's not, uh, again, it's not going to give you the entire mesh of your part, it's going to give you the mesh associated with just a the first phase of your part but that should be enough for our demonstration and okay if this mesh is empty it means that it's null then probably we do not have to set the attribute and if not then we should store this mesh in all curve and for that we are going to use another attribute which is t data and this time it's not std it's xtd because it's sort of an extension and there is an attribute named triangulation and I have to go and include this thing here there we go and as usual I just need to set this attribute to my label using my root label here and pass here a mesh so this is how things of work here so again this is not exactly the good code to to reproduce so watch out if you want to have a full bulk of mesh you'd better to merge your facets into a single triangulation but let's keep it and here okay so what what i'm going to do now is i'm going to uh, start using this meshes label the same way i used this parts label to create my parts so now let's create some meshes and for that I'm going to use again this tag source and create like a new child under my meshes label there we go so now I have this mesh and I am ready to initialize it with a part. So create mesh from part number, uh, I think it's part number two because it is exactly the part which, contain, which contains this box here. Yeah, so we create a mesh from this part. Maybe I should also kind of return this. Uh, I don't think we have to return anything. Yeah, because it's exactly the same structure here. What is missing is a reference, because according to our scheme we are also going to have this reference from my mesh to a part. So let's see how we can do this. 
For that, I am going to take advantage of this TDF reference attribute. So this is yet another package that contains some standard attributes. To remind you, we used quite a lot from the tdata std package. When we use one attribute from tdata xtd package, and now we are going to use something from tdf package. So it also comes with some attributes we want to use, and tdf references is tdf references one of such. So we have this tdf reference, and I think we can just set it. I have a variation of this set method which accepts a label uh, where I want to have this attribute which is going to be my root here and also the region it's a label uh, I want to reference so here it's going to be a root and then I need to extract the label from my part so uh, I have this part and actually I want to get its label here the only problem is that I do not have this function as of now, so I need to go back to my part and give it such a method. So it's going to return its own root label. And we can even declare it as const reference like this and return just to return the root one. Yeah. So there we go. Now we uh, would expect to have this. Uh, to have this reference set on our meshes. Did I make any mistake? Get label. Uh, I think it should be all fine. Yeah. So, the only thing which is not going to work is that actually once we create a part with this box, this box doesn't contain any meshes really because what it contains is the analytical representation of a box but it doesn't contain any facets because facets are built only when you explicitly ask open cascade to build some facets for you so uh, in order to make things work uh, we need also to mesh our part and for that we need to use a mesher which is brep mesh i think yeah it's incremental mesh this thing here so maybe we can mesh our part at the same time when we set a shape, because why not? So we can run this mesher right here in the set shape method. And let's just initialize it right away because uh, it can do the job in its constructor. And for that, we only have to pass the shape and linear deflection. I think it's a mandatory parameter. So let me put just 1.0 here, like one millimeter. And for the rest of parameters, I do not really care. So I guess it's kind of enough. Yeah, you see that this, uh, this constructor, if you pass a shape right here, it automatically calls the perform method. So I would expect that it's going to give me the mesher. So let's see how it's going to proceed. And I will put a breakpoint in my create method for my iMesh data structure. And let's give it a go and let's see what's, what's going to happen. So here we are, we have our part shape. You see, it's a real shape, it's uh, solid. And now we have this empty triangulation. We start iterating our shape by faces. We take one face, we take one mesh, and you see it's not empty. And it contains uh, how many triangles? It contains just two triangles because, I mean, it's not surprises because uh, we have a planar face and the corresponding triangulation for a planar face with a rectangular domain uh, would be just a couple of triangles. So here we go. We have this mesh. We set our triangulation and we set a reference. So let's see uh, what is going to happen with our document. So now we have these parts. One part is with features. And we have a mesh. You see that there is a tdata xtd triangulation and there is a reference and this reference points to 0, 1, 2 and this is exactly our second part. So what we didn't do, we did not give our uh, mesh any name, that's why it's sort of unnamed here, but it doesn't really matter and I think 
you get the principle right so you, you know now how to put the references and actually you might also want to put some back references and for that there are some other attributes you might want to use but I think this is this is not that important for understanding the principles of OCAV but uh, let's wrap it up for today and I think we covered pretty much what I was uh, thinking to cover and uh, maybe uh, it's not everything you might want to know about OCAV and if you still have any questions if you want to design your data model if you have some specific uh, issues you would like to address then feel free to post a comment or join us at our forum at analysisinstitutes.org and uh, let's help each other, let's uh, share experiences and have a nice day and see you later.